Welcome, everyone. And yeah, well, we have a bigger than expected technical issue. My collaborator, who should have presented the talk, couldn't make it, and then had um, other issue which avoided him to um, kind of hand in the actual talk material. But well, I mean, since you're here, and I guess uh, you're interested in basically um, differential, differentiable programming on, on GPUs, um, I will just maybe a bit shorter than you have an hour, but can give you an overview of basically what was the topic in the talk that should have been given, combining quickly two things. So I'm sorry that the title is not the one that's on the program, but it's kind of the essence. And well, I guess I can give you um, a higher level overview, maybe not to the exact point what what's in the abstract, but I'm kind of open to discuss afterwards uh, Yeah, with you or we can then discuss what should have been in the talk, but um, the, the kind of material is is the same. So kind of that's something that I presented yesterday at the Julia for HPC. So well, who we are? We are kind of uh, in a glaciology lab and uh, collaborating. So myself, Ludovic, and Ivan, uh, who was the original presenter of the talk, we're in Zurich at the glaciology lab, um, and we're collaborating with Sam and other people uh, in Julia and supercomputing. And so what we are interested after is to kind of bring Julia to kind of um, at scale and use Julia to tackle, well, GPU computing and GPU supercomputers, but yeah, to do science with it. And um, yeah, the, so the science uh, we do uh, is, or currently we're interested in, in ice flow model and so like large scale model uh, the way we do it, we kind of work on different tools, but one of the current tool we're developing is called FastEyes. Uh, it's a um, kind of fluid dynamic Stokes solver, like in 3D, it works also in like lower dimension, but so we're doing CFD type computation, but for viscous fluid with application to uh, earth and environmental sciences. Um, but yeah, the domain we tackle are pretty big, so it's kind of makes it impossible to do it on a single laptop or even on a, just a server node. So that's why we need to scale out and go on supercomputers. Um, one reason why Julia is interesting for us, maybe just briefly, is that it really reduces the, or makes the development cycle more easy. So. With Julia, it's easy to prototype. When we have a prototype, we try to develop our tools that they kind of scale or directly the same code. Could we, we could scale it up, like developing on the laptop while commuting, uh, fixing things, and then while well, go to work and kind of can launch things on a server, on a supercomputer. And with the idea that there is a single code that does all, because that's kind of really uh, improves the um, kind of, well, avoids bug, make the Kind of development cycle kind of less costly and so we got like recently a flagship project which is um, kind of the biggest european supercomputing allocation which is like running julian gpu on the lumi supercomputer and for this we got about five million gpu hours to actually resolve uh, ice flow in 3d over greenland and well, there just ice flow modeling is nothing new, but what we're really after is like for a uh, long story short, is the map here that you see is a flow speed over Greenland, where it's red, it doesn't move, where it's blue and purple, it moves at kilometer per day. And so there are a couple of so-called ice streams where most of the ice is lost of Greenland. So actually the, the, the major outlet, the major loss of mass of, uh, of ice that then ends up in the um, ocean and well contributes to sea level rise is uh, only by a couple of few outlets where kind of things go super fast. Mm. And then well, the question is like, okay, we really would need to better understand why it's happened there and not there. And like for this, there are models that exist, but they, they use parametrization. And now the goal is really to try to get more, more physics inside. Mm. And to get this physics, well, one needs 
uh, models that actually resolve these physics, uh, physical processes, which is like strain localization, heat localization, spontaneous localization, and these processes, well, they need to be resolved at the accurate, like in space and time, which requires like small time steps. So one needs to take small snapshots, which means many snapshots to kind of cover a finite time. And one also needs to kind of have an accurate, like a high enough spatial resolution because, well, otherwise we, well, if, yeah, basically, uh, if you want to see small features on a TV screen that has a bad resolution, it's not that they're not there. It's just like you cannot, you will miss it. Like, and so that's a bit uh, the challenge. And so the good news with all this, and maybe also the exciting step that I will now cover a bit more, is really the, so, we have data. Huh? There is some, this map here is mostly satellite data. So kind of one has data for a surface, what's happened on the surface. But what we're interested after, obviously, it's rather what happens at the interface with the bedrock. So, uh, and there it comes. So we'll try to uh, make some use, use this data, which is usually the case when you have data, you have a model, then you would need to kind of make some procedure to integrate those data in the model. And well, that's kind of UQ and optimization. And so, well, now we are trying, we are after trying to combine some tools that would work good for us to make that happen in parallel, massively parallel on GPUs. So yeah, well, the kind of global um, framework where we do it, so it's like full stoke simulation and coupled some multi-physics. So it's not only the formation and mechanics, but it's also like heat, so temperature evolution, how temperature is coupled back to the deformation, how deformation may impact back the temperature, and uh, potentially also uh, like the uh, fluid flow. So well, when you heat up the ice, at some point it would, even before really melting, it would still increase the moisture level in the ice. So you generate water content, and this water content would impact also the mechanical behavior of the ice, and so on. And that's, those are tightly coupled processes. So uh, yeah, obviously there is kind of some multi-physics uh, going on. So maybe just to kind of show what those things look like. So that's a, that's a synthetic case where we have a valley-like um, um, bedrock, and then there is ice here, and here we were looking, well, we are investigating like the effect of basal roughness, so the, how the basal topography basically would impact uh, flow localization. So if I run the movie, um, so the arrows here, they show like how the, it's inclined, so over time basically the ice flow would, would accelerate, and at some point when it gets uh, suffic oops, sufficiently fast, I don't know if I can pause it. When it goes sufficiently fast, you will see there's some lentils here that are contoured that appear, and that's basically where um, it heats up enough because of what's so-called, so one sees it here, so it heats up enough on the bumps by so-called shear heating, so uh, internal deformation of the ice would kind of lower the, like would make it easier to flow, and then those uh, patches would start to connect like it's displayed here and create some internal shear zone or some some layer where it slides easily and that would act like a, yeah like a preferential uh, slip layer and with this we well that's kind of the things we're after because those well those would lead to if that happens locally then you would get like instead of having the eyes to viscously deform like uh, honey flowing down a slope it can just slide like a, like a plug much faster and those type of things we're um, we're interested to kind of tackle and resolve with uh, our um, our approach. And obviously you can see that welder is a good candidate because so we can predict surface velocities on the top and um, then m try to match it with observable and well, kind of try to invert what are, for example, material parameters like in the eyes or a characteristic of the bedrock that would give us a better fit of those velocities. And that's called this inversion um, approaches. And yeah, so that this I talked like more yesterday in, in another workshop, but so the, as I said in the introduction, so the reason why we use Julia 
is that it's really um, it allows us empower us to to do this like in a very uh, on a high level more high level fashion in a more integrated thing so let's say it's portability in many ways uh, because while it's portable we have a, we try to have a single code it's portable we can try to target different architecture it's portable in the development because well we can yeah somehow do it so it, it can become somehow a one man activity kind of um, because yeah, it's all contained. And also performance portability because all this becomes somehow portable and performant. So that's really, in a nutshell, why, why it's interesting. And the uh, Julia language now on top of that has this killer feature, which is differentiability of the entire stack. So Julia is mostly written in Julia, and Julia has these um, differentiable programming capabilities that would, yeah, since since the a, uh, automatic differentiation tool like enzymes, zygot, uh, forward diff, et cetera, they know what to expect. They, they will get like to crunch Julia language that can be handled properly, which is very different from other languages where obviously there are AD tools that exist in for Fortran that exist maybe for C or C++. But obviously then if you have some um, kind of general purpose Python based codes that would call in compiled functions, you won't be able to differentiate that entire stack. So you'll be able maybe to differentiate the compiled code with a specific tool. So that's kind of the problem that you would hit with other kind of framework and that in Julia you don't have because, well, it's all consistent. Um, yeah, so maybe before I'll just show you kind of how kind of uh, vanilla workflow looks like and then we can I have a little demo on actually using automatic differentiation within Julia to make a, a joint based inversion so that's uh, one way of making optimization that's classically done in computational glaciology computational geodynamics let's put it computational earth sciences so but maybe to make it less dry and I'm sorry for those who didn't want who didn't came here to look at code but I guess that's a uh, pretty uh, nice little piece of code. Um, thanks to Julia, thanks to the kind of work we tried to do to make it math close. So uh, I guess everyone recognized here that we have some flux that we compute in the first function. And these flux, we balance them to update the quantity h. Uh, could be a shallow ice equation here where h is the integrated height, like the, the height that one measure, but it can be just heat diffusion or, or any other thing. Uh, and, and the approach we take and why Julia is interesting for us is that we, here we kind of work. There are several of these packages that try to uh, abstract a bit the back end. And that's what's done in Parallel Stencil, for example, a package that we're, uh, we're working on uh, with well, Sam, uh, myself, and others, uh, where we kind of can first, we can have, well, different precision support different number of dimension here it's a 3d code and maybe most interestingly we can have like support for various backend so-called so it can target cpu threads it can target a uh, amd gpus and also nvidia gpus and uh well metal and soon all well, all what's available for example in the julia gpu stack and then basically we can write these functions that are backend agnostic uh and uh, call them somehow in the main and well like like true works so or just in time compile we there's optimization optimization passes by the languages and we apply stencil operation uh, optimization on top of that such that it's kind of hidden by the user but there is some kind of some interesting thing going up in the in the background um, uh, that makes the code performant and target like spe specific for different for example GPU architecture without putting the burden on the user to actually have to to know about all that and write it and somehow um, I use those codes for I mean, the teaching I'm doing and like well code that fit in a single page uh, every student can somehow get what's going on and on top of that it runs at close to memory copy performance on for example latest GP um, and yeah so for those who kind of have some knowledge on that so I, Julia is actually going doing good also in HPC so well for example, we benchmark the things versus like classical heap C++. So that, so that would be the, the, the standard AMD uh, GPU um, DSL to do things in C++ and we get like same performance. Doesn't mean that, uh, yeah, 
So that just means that for Julia, for us, it's really good that we perform at least as good as others. Um, yeah, and then, so to scale up and to do more things with our little code. So for example, now this little code I showed before was like, would run on a single server, like on a single GPU on my laptop, for example. But now if I want to take that to kind of to scale out to a supercomputer, I basically only need to add these couple of lines where that are highlighted in red so I can use some package that um, uh, handles this domain decomposition. So basically for those for which it rings a bell, MPI in the background, and I can then, uh, well, initialize what's called the global grid. So how much time I want to replicate my local process um, and just update Halo. So the thing, how it works, stencil on distributed computing. So I have little local processes, but they each sub process doesn't know about the other, but they talk via boundary condition. And either if you're on the edges, you have the global physics boundary condition. If you're internally, you exchange boundaries between neighboring process. That's done by the update halo and then tear down the thing. But still, little code fits in a page, and it's fairly understandable, which is the beauty of, I guess, of Julia. And then, yeah, with those little codes, we get very good parallel efficiency. So kind of trying to see how much how much we lose from going from one, one GPU to thousands of GPU, it's only a couple of percent, and that's also very, uh, very nice features. Um, and now the big thing, so actually the differ differentiable programming is actually not much more complicated in, in Julia, and that's really nice. Um, there are these, well, extraordinary tools that, that do it. Uh, we, well, there are many, um, or there are a couple of different. We use Enzyme because Enzyme is the only one that supports to actually differentiate, truly differentiate through GPU kernels. So GPU programming is a bit specific because the code that executes on the GPU has to be, well, statically typed, and then it's kind of goes down another compilation path, and so it's kind of a bit tricky. And this, well, en what Enzyme does, it, it analyzes the, really the, the GPU kernels and actually would create yet another GPU kernel to do the uh, accumulation, the, the reverse kind of, um, the reverse functionality that we do with AD. And that's built in in Julia, and so we included it in our package. And yeah, so basically that's what called, uh, that's the forward model, and then if I had now an inverse model, it would just, yeah, basically need to add where I want to accumulate my gradients uh, with respect to, I can define if I want uh, which kind of mode I want. So if I want the gradient with respect to the residual, and that's done by default, and then I get by my gradient, which I can then use to make uh, to make my joint um, my joint solutions. And um, performance-wise, it's super interesting because uh, so the forward models. We, so how we measure here uh, is like memory throughput. So we are memory bound, so memory operations, or so memory access is really what limits us. And so the forward model is really, well, we're not at memory throughput here with that example, but uh, with latest optimization, we can get very close. And still we're more than about a terabyte per second here. And the inverse model, so the inverse, the AD-based call of the forward function is uh, get half of the throughput. For a function that does much more things, that's not written by me, but generated by at um, compile time, and that's actually super good. And it runs on the GPU, like with the same launch parameters, et cetera, so it's very, in that sense, it's very portable. And yeah. The cool thing, though, is that we need much less iteration for the, or we need to less to call much less time the um, kind of um, um, uh, yeah um, AD based function. So at the end of the day, we kind of the the the, the adjoint solve or the, in, the 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 AD based thing we need to make the adjoint solve uh, goes much faster just because also we have less iteration and the base performance isn't that bad uh, neither. So in the remaining, um, yeah, in the remaining two, three minutes, what I can uh, just kind of show you is uh, something we did at the workshop. So it's not on, uh, it's not on ice flow there. It was just to, uh, to, motivate the, to motivate the thing, but yeah. So that's a, that's a um, demo setup, for example, where here I have um, 
So I have a solution where I have injection, so it's kind of underground operation. So I have diffusion, well, diffusive, a diffusive process, and I have injection and extraction of um, fluid in a porous reservoir. And I have two wells, and this is my pressure distribution, and that's how my underground looks like. So I have a permeability or a, like diffusivity that's one, and that's very low in the middle where I have a barrier. And, um, and that's the fluxes, and that would be the solution of my four models. So I run a steady state, and that's kind of my pump in, pump out setup. And now what I want to do is I want to say, OK, I have observation, these uh, white dots, where I know I have a pressure sensor. And then I want to uh, actually uh, try to guess or invert for what, what, is, what needs the permeability to be such that, um, yeah, such that the, with my new permeability guess, computed pressure field at those points, and I try to minimize that error. And uh, this, doing it with the adjoint approach, uh, what I need to do, so I would have to have basically um, one forward solver that I use to make my synthetic here, but that also would just solve the, uh, so that's this little thing here, where I just solve my fluxes, update my fluxes, uh, get my pressure residual, update my pressure, and, and that's it. And that's kind of, with this I can evaluate a forward solution for, for a given uh, layout. And then I have the adjoint solution, which is nice in that iterative framework that we use. It's exactly the same structure, it's just now the kernel, they're kind of, uh, because it's the transpose, so they're shifted, but um, they, it's exactly the same structure. So it's very simple to change. And this code here where I'll show you the result is like all in all uh, with visualization 300 lines and it does everything. It's kind of self-contained somehow, which makes it also very nice and easy to, to debug things. And if we go back so to our inversion setup, uh, we can go through the inversion steps. So we start from an initial solution, and this is with 50 steps of vanilla gradient descent, where the actually adjoint solver, I didn't kind of derive anything. I just use AD to build my adjoint solution and use it in a gradient descent where I just update uh, with the adjoint solution and the forward solution. I use it to um, kind of build up my to get my gradient, and then I use this gradient to try to find a better distribution of permeability. And then if I go along the lines, I see that, well, I converge somewhere, and at the very end, well, I found, I reduced my, or my loss rate, or et cetera, uh, my error in the inversion procedure decreased two and a half order of magnitude, and I found a um, distribution of permeability that would make the pressure at the observation points uh, kind of minimize that, that thing. And, and that code here, the one that I show you in front of your eyes, that's kind of the code, if you remember, so it uses implicit global grid, parallel stencil, well, this one is in 2D, but it runs on GPU, so, well, I have no more time here, and it may be a bit just uh, not on this, uh, straight to the point right now, but that code is on GitHub, and, well, if you take it and run it on GPU server, then the entire set of computation is done in parallel with MPI, on different GPUs, and well, if you have access to a supercomputer, you can just scale it out as well. So yeah, well, I mean to um, kind of, I leave this as an outlook, and again, I'm kind of apologize for not being exactly the talk that you expect to have, but I hope that I could still cover a bit like GPU-based AD, and yeah, I'm really open to, well, if you have questions and want to discuss, then we can, uh, yeah, you can reach out to me. Thank you. Okay, uh, very interesting work, thank you. Um, you didn't say this explicitly, but I, wasn't, I was a little bit unsure about how you define the inverse problem, because don't you need a likelihood function, or maybe you, you just use the difference between your simulation that came out of the PD, yes. PDE to the data, or, or something like this, and then you assume that this is some least yes. square difference or something? Yes, yeah, so in that sense here, yeah, since I was, um, I didn't have time to get those technical slides, but um, so the inverse problem, we define it as, the, so the, the, the loss function here is just the um, L2 norm of the observed versus the, well, um, data, or model versus data, so it's, it would be, uh, can, well, 
I have it here. It's like it would it it would return this. So we have some observation, and then to evaluate the loss, we evaluate one forward solve, and then we take the yeah st just standard standard thing. Hi. Uh, so the capability of uh, doing AD through GPU code is uh, super interesting. I was wondering whether you need LLVM to do the AD in the GPU code, right? So suppose somebody writes a CUDA kernel and then goes through the NVCC path, then is it possible to do AD through that code? Because NVIDIA doesn't give you access to the uh, internals of the LLVM. So do you yeah. run into that problem? Because I hear that uh, generating kernels through NVCC might have performance advantages sometimes. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a good question. So the um, I guess it's so it's based on so enzyme uses um, kind of uh, it's it's done at LLVM level. So I I'm unsure it would work with just plain but let's say C CUDA and NVCC. So that's really a a feature of having actually the access to the uh, to it in in Julia yeah. and it works at the GPU right below GPU compiler level. So. Uh, I guess for technicalities, I guess you, if you find Valentine, surely, then sure, I, I can but, clear. But yeah, I mean, it's that's the cool thing. That's really kind of well now since a couple of months, I go. It's really the killer. Well, at least for us, it's really the killer feature of of yeah. Julia. Or one of the killer feature because well, it, it really allows to yeah. to differentiate well. Are like at least arbitrary uh, GPU code, meaning like at least CUDA, AMD GPU, and one API. I guess they will yeah. be differentiable. Um, yeah, sure. on a high performance yeah. um, kind I mean, of. This upgrade. will be a good uh, growth path to have. Uh, I'll talk to Valentin. Super. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right, we're out of time, but let's thank you again, Ludwig. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>